it's a pleasure to continue this session with Steven Golovich, who used to be a colleague of Michael Weinstein at, but maybe I should let him say that, at Bell Laboratories. Uh, Steven Golovich will uh, speak on orbital angular momentum and spin orbit coupling of light in optical fiber. Okay, is this, is this on? Yeah. Good. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and the hosts for having this uh, nice meeting. Um, so as Eduardo said, I was, had the good fortune to be put in the office directly across the hall from Michael at, um, in building uh, 2C, I guess, Murray Hill. Um, and one thing I noticed quickly about Michael is that his door was always open. Um, and I think partly as a result of that, I had the privilege of working with Michael on some problems in optical fiber uh, that were motivated by um, then current um, experiments and applications. So today I'm going to be talking about a different problem in optical fiber motivated by now current um, experiments and applications. Um, even though it's not directly with Michael, I hope some of his influence will be apparent. Um, so um, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, orbital angular momentum of light has been a, a kind of a hot topic. Um, here's just a few of the applications. Um, Quantum cryptography, it started in optics with um, entanglement of, of uh, um, uh, polarization degrees of freedom. Um, higher dimensional um, bases are, are useful for increasing the robustness of QKD, and um, here's a recent experiment using OAM. Um, particle manipulation, you can spin a particle about its axis using polarization. You can um, spin using OAM, you can spin particles around a, a common axis. Uh, mode division multiplexing, um, here's a free space example uh, done at USC. Um, OAM is a spatial degree of freedom, so you can, uh, it's another degree of freedom for multiplexing. And um, another uh, related um, aspect to that is you want to do high pi communications, or that's photon information efficiency. Um, it turns out that if you, um, if you box yourself in by um, constraining a high data rate, high spectral efficiency, um, uh, you um, and high photon efficiency, uh, you're stuck. The uh, the information theory tells you that you you have to use um, multiple spatial modes, and um, so that's a related aspect to this. Um, and with a lot of these applications, uh, these are all free space ones. And the, the natural question is, what about optical fiber? If you're talking about communications, um, that's something you definitely want to do with fiber. Um, and even for other you know applications with beams, um, it would be nice to be able to deliver or generate them using optical fiber. Um, and it turns out that there has been um, stability issues with that. And so one thing I'll be uh, kind of a motivation for this work is, is one way of eliminating that instability. Um, so a lot of the free space applications, oops, sorry about that. A lot of the free space applications are done using um, the Gargassian beams, um, which have the, uh, this, these helical corkscrew um, um, uh, uh, beam patterns um, and the donut intensities. Um, um, in general, uh, well, we just saw in the last talk um, um, how to describe paraxial beams. Uh, these LG beams um, behave exactly like you'd expect. Uh, they have an OAM of, of, that should read L h bar per photon, where L is the winding number. Um, and in general, for classical paraxial beams, you can um, write down the uh, the uh, orbital and spin angular momenta per unit length, and um, these uh, for like Garagassian beams, these tell you exactly what you'd expect. Uh, the um, spatial beam pattern gives you the orbital part, and it's the polarization. Uh, this is a Jones vector that gives you the spin part. And quantum mechanically, the um, Z components of the quantum mechanical op corresponding quantum mechanical operators generate independently rotations of the mode patterns and the polarization spec uh, separately. So these behave exactly like you'd expect. I'm going to revisit that later. Um, and I should add that um, on the, at the single photon level, the OAM um, was measured in entanglement demonstrated in uh, about uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think that um, is what uh, prompted a lot of the interest um, in, these, in these beams. I have this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about fiber. Um, it turns out you can't talk about fiber without talking about spin-orbit coupling. Uh, 
Um, that's something that's absent in paraxial beams. Uh, you see it at step index interfaces. Um, the, the Fresnel equations are um, polarization dependent. And that gives rise to some more subtle effects called the Guth Hanschen and Imbert Fedorovs, which are shifts that are um, spin dependent. The if you have a finite beam, the center mass of that beam is shifted by an amount that depends on the polarization of the input beam. And these effects have been known for quite some time, but really it hasn't really been worked out in satisfactory detail until quite recently. This is a 2013 uh, review paper. And then in a gradient index isotropic medium, um, you see uh, um, a Berry phase um, which is a, uh, a polarization dependence on trajectory and the spin hull effect, which is a trajectory dependence on polarization. Um, again, these, some, these effects, at least the Berry phase, in some sense goes back quite some time, but it's really only been in the last five or 10 years that um, they've really been put on a, on a really um, satisfactory basis. And the spin hull effect is, has been, uh, it's much more recent that it's been appreciated. <clears throat> Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the, the motivating work um, for the optical fiber um, aspect of this. Uh, a lightning review of optical fiber modes. Um, if we look at the, uh, at the this, this is just Maxwell's equations for the transverse um, electric field. If we ignore the vector terms, we just get the scalar. Um, uh, wave equation, and we, um, we see that the scalar modes, uh, they split up into groups of two or four. Uh, these are called the linearly polarized or LP sets. Um, the fundamental modes are the LP01, it's doubly degenerate, and then the excited states, LP11, LP21, et cetera, um, are, are fourfold degenerate, um, and then there can be higher. Uh, the first index is the angular, the second is the radial index. There can be higher um, radial indexes as well but not in this talk. Um, these can be written in terms of modes that look like, kind of like Laguerre Gaussian beams. Um, there's a spatial part and a, um, I mean, a, a radial dependent um, intensity um, term and then the, the helical phase term. Uh, so these carry the, uh, the L h bar per photon OAM that you would expect. Um, except in the LP11 case is kind of a special case, you get the transverse electric and magnetic um, states, which, which don't. But the doubly degenerate, those are um, singly degenerate or not degenerate. The, uh, the HE21 set is doubly degenerate, and these can be formed into OAM states um, where the, uh, the spin is constrained to lie in the same direction as the orbital angular momentum. Now, so this looks like um, a candidate for um, doing uh, transmission in an OAM state. The problem is that in conventional fibers, the splitting in effective index, which is um, related to the uh, propagation con con constant, uh, the splittings here are very small, on order of 10 to the minus five or smaller. And that means that these modes, um, elliptical perturbations uh, varying along the length of the fiber, which are always present, can couple them very easily. And in practice, that means that within you know, centimeters or shorter, um, these uh, patterns will mix with the transverse modes and uh, be destroyed. A solution, a possible solution, is to split, um, try to arrange your fiber design to split these transverse modes far away from the HE2 ones. Um, if we can get that splitting to be greater than 10 to the minus four, why 10 to the minus four? Because that's what works for conventional polarization maintaining fibers, single mode fibers. Um, that uh, potentially would render these modes stable. Now it turns out such a fiber exists. There's some work that we did at Bell Labs in the uh, mid, early to mid, um, thoughts um, on, um, on uh, for a different application, which is uh, long period gratings, which are, are mechanical gratings, which couple the uh, fundamental mode to the um, first excited, the LP11 um, modes. The problem with conventional fibers when you try to do this is that there's a polarization dependence in the grating. Um, if you come in with a, uh, there exists a state of polarization which mixes only the, uh, the HE and the TM, and that gives rise to one resonance. And then there's a different one which mixes an H, the other HE with the TE mode, and that gives rise to a slightly different um, resonance. This is not desirable. So our solution was to come up with a design for a fiber that just moves the TE and the TM far away in effective index. 
thereby giving us a really wide bandwidth over which our grading will couple only the, the two HE states and those are degenerate. So on this scale, this looks like, um, this is an experimental result, it looks like it worked quite nicely. Um, in fact, if you look closely, there's still a little bit of, 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 of um, um, polarization dependence there. Uh, the reason for that is um, manufacturing uh, perturbations, uh, ovality in the fiber. We thought that that could be resolved with better manufacture. Um, this was happening at Bell Labs in the early 2000s, I mentioned. Uh, so anyone who was there at the time will appreciate why we didn't have a chance to pursue this any further. Um, but the fiber, at least, was designed and fabricated and tested. So some years later, um, uh, oh, sorry, this is the, the solution. Um, so again, at the time, we just wanted to uh, design, so I just wanted to design something that worked. Um, it turns out there's very simple considerations based on perturb perturbation theory, which um, can tell you how to do this, uh, which is basically you want a narrow ring. A narrow ring will confine the mode in such a way that the, the polarization splitting becomes um, wider. And um, I will go more into this. Um, that's the second half of the talk. Um, it's a, a deep, deeper reasons for, for why, this, why this happens. Um, so some years later, uh, Ramachandran, now at BU, um, studied propagation of these various modes in the fiber. And so he was able to show that the T and TM modes propagate stably by themselves. And he was able to show that the HE21 modes can in fact um, propagate stably by themselves as well. And that's seen in this, uh, this is an interferometric experiment which shows you you're interfering the OAM beam with uh, basically a expanded Gaussian beam which gives you these characteristic spirals associated with the helical wave front. So that shows that they were able to transmit OAM beams, in this case, over a kilometer. A kilometer is not impressive to anyone doing long haul communications. Um, it is impressive compared to previous demonstrations of OAM and fiber, which were maybe centimeters. So it's uh, uh, several orders of magnitude improvement. Um, we also showed um, the uh, uh, you can use such a fiber to uh, control the OAM states um, by, uh, by um, uh, controlling the, uh, the input or at the output, input or output, the, um, the polarization states. You can generate any linear combination in this uh, two-dimensional degenerate subspace. subspace. Um, so an analogy here is with the ordinary Poincaré sphere, um, it's a two-dimensional uh, space of, of, of two linear polarizations. Um, the analogous case in, in uh, uh, for the two OM states, it's still a two, two-fold degenerate subspace. Uh, now we're combining, instead of a, a horizontal and vertical polarizations, we're now combining or the linear combinations of, of uh, OAM plus and OAM minus states. And so you, the Poincaré sphere is now uh, corresponds to a different set of OAM states instead of the usual um, circular to linear uh, polarization states. And um, uh, by suitable control of the, um, of the fiber with polarization controllers, you can uh, map a path over this higher order Poincaré sphere. And that's, uh, there's, that's what's going on um, in this plot here. Um, so what about higher order states? So if we go up uh, one more set, um, it turns out all the rest of them um, look the same. So if we look at the LP21 set, again, in the LP basis, um, these look like um, uh, Laguerre Gaussian beams that are all degenerate. We move over and include the vector perturbations. Um, what happens now is, is we don't have the transverse modes anymore. So we get the, um, uh, so these modes, I should say, are labeled HE and EH uh, for reasons that are very obscure and lost to history. Um, but one way you can think of them here is that the HE modes have the spin and the orbital angular momentum, momentum aligned, and the EH modes have the spin and orbital angular momentum anti-aligned. And 
there's a, uh, a, 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 a splitting and effective index or propagation constant that, um, that shows up um, between these two. These are separated. So this is a form of spin orbit coupling because with the HE ones, we have the spin and orbital angular momentum aligned. If we flip the spin degree of freedom, um, but keep the orbital one fixed, we get the EH modes and that causes a change in effective index. So changing the polarization causes a change in, in, in the propagation properties. So that's a form of spin orbit coupling, which we'll be <clears throat> talking more about. Again, in conventional fiber, uh, this splitting is quite small. So again, we'd like to um, be able to separate those to render them stable. Um, it turns out, so we tried different um, approaches using conventional solid glass fibers. Um, they aren't very satisfactory. Uh, so instead, um, it turns out to be possible to manufacture air core fibers using the, uh, the process that um, OFS uh, uses because they start out with an air core, so they just don't close it and control the pressure during draw. So they were able to, uh, to generate, uh, they're able to um, manufacture air core fibers. And this is nice because this makes for a very large index contrast at this, at this boundary. And it's the index contrasts which um, from perturbation theory we notice gives rise to um, the splitting and effective index. And so by um, cranking this up by an order of magnitude or more, um, it turns out that we are able to get the uh, effective index splitting between these, these H, E, and E, H modes, the OIM plus or minus states, um, to go up by an order of magnitude or so. So that seems like a, um, a nice story. Um, we thought initially it would be the end of the story. But it turns out there's a catch. If you look at the glass core fiber, it has the same stru polarization structure that um, we were seeing in the, uh, the, in the lower order original vortex fiber, which is, and you see in, in, in all conventional weakly guided fibers, you get uh, circularly polarized um, uh, polarization states. But with this air core fiber, um, we're seeing polarization states that are elliptical, actually highly elliptical. And the elliptical ones are not, actually, are not um, spatially, the ellipses rotate as you go around the fiber, so it's not spatially invariant. So that makes, uh, well, for a puzzle as to why is this happening, it also makes for um, an experimental problem, which is that um, it, and you can't just stick a circular polarizer in front of this in order to launch these beams. It's a much harder, more delicate experimental problem. So I'm going to be addressing um, this resolution to this uh, puzzle in the rest of the talk. Um, but I should add that uh, we actually weren't the first um, to uh, notice something like this. Um, the atom guiding community, atom guiding community uh, actually studied air core fibers um, back uh, uh, in the mid 90s. And um, they did notice that they only looked at fundamental modes, I believe, but they did notice that these, these polarization states, um, these should be linearly polarized and they're not. So it's the, this, this, this polar, unconventional polarization, polarization states um, uh, were present um, back then. So um, moving on to spin orbit coupling. I'm going to start with um, talking about um, non-paraxial beams in free space. It turns out this will guide our solution for the fiber problem. Uh, this was done by Lyak and, and collaborators um, five years ago. Um, so Bessel beams are um, beams that are constructed from plane waves um, with a, um, angular support concentrated at one polar angle. And um, they're given, um, they're, they're, they're constructed with waves from definite helicity of plus or minus one. And if you look at the, the scalar case, uh, then you see that the, um, the L parameter is um, 
uh, if you look at the intensity pattern, then the intensity, um, the, the, pen, the donuts um, get larger and larger radius as the L value increases. Um, that's you know, what we'd expect from the behavior of, of angular momentum, just pushing the beams out. Um, but if you, if you look at the vector case and, and construct the beams with the given fixed value of L, given helicity, but um, the um, helicity changes from a plus to a minus, what you notice is that this is a scalar case in the middle. Um, what you notice is that the, uh, the ring gets wider when you have the uh, helicity um, uh, co-aligned plus and, and gets smaller when it's anti-aligned. So, um, and this is, this is an intensity pattern. So we're seeing an effect here of, of spin orbit coupling. We're changing the polarization, the spin state, and we're seeing an effect on the, the spatial mode patterns. So this can be um, understood with geometric optics. Um, I'll go a little bit more into this later, but um, it turns out that the, uh, the rays for this problem are, there are straight lines um, emanating from a, um, there's a caustic surface, which is a cylinder, and they have a fixed um, uh, angle, polar angle that they're leaving um, the, the caustic surface from. And if we draw a closed path that winds around the caustic surface and comes back, uh, the phase matching quantization condition is that it has to pick up a um, um, integral um, times two pi uh, value. Um, and when you calculate it, it turns out that the caustic radius um, is given not just by the, uh, the angular momentum, um, uh, the L value of the, 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 the winding number, but there's also another term dependent on phi b, which is a Berry phase. And um, that um, Berry phase um, turns out to be associated with this, uh, well, there's a Berry um, uh, gauge field, Berry vector potential associated with that, which is, corresponds to a, a field strength, um, which behaves like a magnetic monopole at the origin. And so the, the, the Berry phase that we're picking up is equal to the flux coming through this surface enclosed by um, the, uh, the uh, um, contour on the momentum sphere, which corresponds to when we, what happens to our momentum as we wind around the caustic surface. Um, so uh, this also, if you calculate the, uh, the orbital and spin angular momenta, you see the same, um, the, the Berry phase shows up there, it's the same effect um, in, uh, and it's seen in a different way. So here we see spin orbit coupling in non-paraxial beams. And let me have a brief aside. Um, the angular momentum of a, of a free uh, electromagnetic field, um, if you look in textbooks, uh, they say that separation of total angular momentum into the spin and orbi uh, orbital parts is impossible for two reasons. One is that the spin should equal to the total AM in the rest frame, but photons don't have a rest frame. You only have helicity. And the second is that the, sp uh, the spin operator should generate rotations of just polarization. But if you did that, you would destroy transversality and free um, EM fields have to be transverse. Now classically, you can um, write down, um, you can do a decomposition into um, what look like um, into the uh, orbital and spin parts of angular momentum. And they, they, they look like they should be. I mean, if you look at the, the power transfer that this is what these operators should look like. Um, but if you look at the corresponding quantum mechanical operators, um, they're perfectly well-defined um, physical observables, but they're not angular momentum generators. They do not generate rotations, it turns out. They have the wrong commutation relations in the non-paraxial um, limit. So this is really the origin of spin orbit coupling is the transversality of the fields. Um, moving on to gradient index, um, gradient index media. Um, uh, for scalar waves, um, you can write down Lagrangian for the, the ray paths, um, including the vector terms. Um, and moving to first order approximation in lambda over L, where L is the characteristic length scale of the gradient of the um, um, inhomogeneities of the index of refraction. Um, that now is when we can see that there's a Berry phase, which is this trajectory dependent polarization variation and the orbit optical spin Hall effect, which is a polarization dependent trajectory perturbation. 
Um, and we can uh, see this. This was, uh, so again, these ideas go back some time, but they're really put in a nice form um, fairly recently. Um, uh, we can see this by, um, by uh, attaching a coordinate frame to the, uh, the, the first order geometric optics um, beam and um, looking at Maxwell's equations in, these, um, in this, this rotating uh, coordinate system. Uh, so because it's uh, not inertial, you pick up a Coriolis term uh, right here, and um, we see it's diagonalized in the, space, uh, in the basis of circular polarizations. So the, the plus and minus helicity states evolve independently but differently. Um, now this co-moving frame, it turns out, depends only on the, on the, on the momentum, not in the position. Uh, so you're basically moving around on the momentum sphere. Um, the spin over at Lagrangian, um, again, defines this Berry uh, gauge potential, uh, which gives rise to the Berry curvature. And um, the Berry gauge potential, um, there's, a, um, uh, there's a gauge degree of freedom there, but the, uh, the curvature is, of course, independent of it. So the consequences are um, the Berry phase is this helicity dependent phase accumulation along a, a, a zeroth order um, geometric optics uh, ray path. And for a closed path, you get a, a gauge invariant um, quantity, this, this Gary phase, Berry phase given by that, um, uh, the, uh, the closed path um, integral. And for a finite, um, for a, a beam of finite width, um, it turns out that the, uh, the center of mass trajectory turns out to be helicity dependent. So this is the spin Hall effect of light. So if you, um, if you start a beam, a uh, finite beam, propagating in some gradient index medium, it turns out if it's left circularly polarized versus right circularly polarized, its center of mass will actually pick up a, um, uh, a, a small, um, uh, there will be a small difference between them, a small shift. And that's something that was, it's only fairly recently that that's been uh, fully appreciated. And that's also been experimentally uh, observed. Now, how does this all apply to optical fiber? Um, so let's go back to the um, Kala-Rubinoff method for um, uh, uh, solving eigenvalue problems. Um, with the geometric theory of diffraction. Um, so for a step index fiber, um, our rays are straight lines, and there's a, we can form a two-parameter two normal congruence um, given by um, the rays leaving the caustic. Um, and if we assign the caustic uh, to some radius, um, so that's one parameter, the radius of the caustic, and the, uh, the, the polar angle of the rays leaving the caustic is the other parameter. Uh, so that forms a simple covering of the region between the caustic and the boundary, where reflections happen. Um, and there's two such um, simple coverings, two such normal congruences form a closed congruence. There's the outgoing beams, outgoing rays, and a family of incoming rays. They're connected at the caustic by just passing through the caustic, and they're connected by um, reflections at the boundary, Fresnel reflections. So the eigenvalue condition is that um, the total Phase accumulation over a closed loop must vanish. Um, and uh, so we have uh, two generators here. One is a loop. Um, we choose one loop just around the caustic. And the other loop uh, starts leaving the caustic, bounces off the uh, cladding, comes back, crosses, crosses through a cross caustic, then goes back around the caustic, and finally back to where it started. These give rise to these two equations, and um, this, uh, there's a couple of phase factors, which are pi over four is the phase you pick up by crossing a caustic, and uh, gamma here is the phase shift on reflection, the Fresnel phase shift on reflection at a boundary. So this was done in the scalar approximation um, in, uh, by a couple of authors in the, in the mid-70s. Um, for the step index fiber, um, vector corrections. Um, so here we observe that um, for a weakly guided step index fiber, um, all the, the rays are going to be um, 
experience grazing incidence angles. So that means that the Fresnel phase shift on grazing uh, reflections is nearly polarization independent. So let's just neglect that entirely. That means that circular polarization is preserved upon reflections. But we're going to include the geometric phase shifts. So that means that this, uh, for the, uh, this generator here, uh, we end up with the Berry phase due to um, this, the path around the, the caustic. That's, uh, if I, this is the momentum sphere viewed, viewed from along the z-axis. And so uh, the, um, the integral around this curve, um, or the integral over this area of the Berry curvature gives us the, um, this Berry phase. Now the other phase that we pick up is due to this path now this path has a, an abrupt uh, reflection in it. So that means that in the momentum, momentum sphere you're going from here to here. And so that means this is no longer, the geometric phase is no longer a Berry phase, it's actually an Anandan Harna phase. But it's the same idea. And um, that's uh, the phase we pick up here. And there's a, uh, a polar, what I'm approximating is a polarization independent <coughs> Um, a Fresnel phase shift, which actually should be divided by two. Sorry about that. So the result of all of this um, can be seen in this plot, which requires a little bit of explanation. The, the black lines are the scalar, um, the scalar effective indices. I've chosen uh, a few values of L, the, uh, the winding number. Um, the black ones are the effective indices of all of the, of the scalar modes that are observed. And um, it turns out that the exact, I can do the exact calculation for this, the exact values overplot the scalar approximations um, on the scale of this plot. And then we're interested in, in the, the splittings between the EHE and the EH, between the, the uh, spin and orbital momentum aligned and anti-aligned states. That's what we're interested in. So on the left, I see what these, these splittings are for the exact calculation. And I should say that um, they're so big here, I've scaled them by 500 so I can put this all in one plot. They're actually on order of like 10 to the minus seven to 10 to the minus five. They're quite small. Uh, so I've multiplied those by 500. On the right, these are the calculation that we get using GTD, including geometric phases. And we see that we pretty much get the right answer uh, to within a few percent. So what that says is that the, um, the, the splitting, the vector um, um, dependence for the weakly guided case is completely captured by the geometric phase. It's not actually due to, um, you don't, not invoking the polarization dependence of Fresnel shift. It's, it's all due to ge the geometric phase. Um, you can also do this for a parabolic fiber. There's no reflections here, it's all continuous. Um, this is a nice example because a lot can be done analytically. Uh, it turns out we, again, get the same story that um, uh, we, we pick up um, to a very good approximation um, the vector effects just due to a Berry phase in this case. And finally, um, in the last few minutes, um, let's get back to the motivating example of the air core ring fiber. So now, let's, um, <clears throat> Whoops, sorry. Um, now uh, we're gonna restrict, now we've got, now our two surfaces here, instead of, um, of, a, of a cladding and, the, and the, the caustic, now our two surfaces are the inner and outer surfaces of the rings. You've got the waves that are bouncing back and forth inside this, um, this the rays are bouncing back and forth inside this narrow ring uh, by total internal reflection. And I'm gonna restrict attention to modes which would have caustics well inside um, this inner boundary because I don't wanna deal with the fact that GDD doesn't do well um, with cost, uh, fields near caustics. Um, so again, we get the same um, two, uh, two normal congruences forming a closed congruence. And we get these uh, eigenvalue equations which are slightly different now because it's two reflections without any caustic crossings. Now we get a total Fresnel phase shift here, which requires some more explanation because now 
we have um, a very large index contrast. So um, even though we're near grazing, we are not near enough grazing for that not to make a difference. So this is a new ingredient now, which is that um, uh, we want to allow general non-circular uh, polarization states defined by a Jones vector attached to each ray. So this gives rise, the single value condition gives rise to now a third eigenvalue equation, um, which I choose to write in Stokes space, and I'm gonna explain that on the um, next uh, couple of slides. Um, so the ansatz we make for GTD is that the, the, the polarizations um, coming for, for an outgoing ray uh, are just um, related to one another. The, the different input polarizations, um, initial data uh, for different rays are related to another, one another by a rotation, which gives rise to rotation matrix in Stokes space. The ref uh, Fresnel reflections uh, give rise to a different um, matrix, the Fresnel matrix, again in Stokes space, and that gives us this eigenvalue equation. And if we look at a couple of special cases um, for meridional rays, which are just bouncing back and forth like this, uh, there is no uh, rotation, that's just the identity, so that gives us this eigenvalue equation. Um, and the Fresnel matrix is, um, is diagonal in this basis, so that gives us our linear polarized modes. So. In this picture, that naturally comes out, uh, and quantitatively as well. I'll show that in a minute. And another limit is um, low contrast um, skew rays. Um, so now what's happening is that we're low contrast, so the, the Fresnel reflection matrix um, doesn't have any polarization dependence anymore. So it's the identity in Stokes space. Uh, so what that means is that we do have this, um, this rotation um, and um, this is our eigenvalue equation. Um, this is the Poincaré sphere. Uh, the only way for um, these, these, these polarization states in Stokes space, Stoke space must be along the axis, which are the circularly polarized modes. So here, this picture has shown us why we want to choose the, uh, the circularly polarized states for the grazing incidence. So this explains what we have assumed before. Um, in general, um, neither the Fresnel nor the rotation Stokes matrices are the identity, uh, and so it's going to be some elliptically polarized um, eigenvector, some arbitrary thing. And uh, we can also compute the fields associated with that by summing the, the, uh, the fields from the two um, normal congruences. Um, and we end up with uh, ellipti elliptically polarized um, modes, which is, uh, that's what we were trying to explain originally. And I'll end up with some uh, results, uh, calculations. Uh, if we look at the fields, um, again, these are the, uh, the spatially varying elliptical polarization that we we're trying to explain. The exact and the GTD calculations um, are quite close to one another, close enough uh, to make me happy. Uh, and this is the effective index um, uh, versus um, air core radius. Um, and again, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the trends are definitely right for the, the splittings of the different modes and the, uh, the absolute values are, are not far off either. So this theory seems to um, do a good job of explaining the phenomena that we're observing in this um, air core ring fiber. So now is the time when I'd like to be able to show you a nice experiment that demonstrates all of this. Um, I can't. Uh, this fiber was fabricated um, by OFS. Um, this is an actual picture of, a, of an actual fiber. Um, so the Ramachandran group tried to, um, tried to uh, uh, launch these states and, and make the measurements that we need to see the purity. Um, they did not succeed. I, none of us think that there's any fundamental reason um, why not, um, but it's a, because of the spatial dependence of the polarization, it's a very delicate experiment. It requires a very fine alignment. Um, spatial light modulators um, only work at one polarization, so you need to split beams and realign. Um, they actually tried a different technique and, and didn't make it work. So what they did instead was they, um, 
they, uh, they used a, um, uh, a ring that was a little too wide and looked only at the um, high, highest uh, order states that were supported, which um, have uh, only grazing incidence on the air core boundary. So that means that there's no polarization dependence there and we're back to where we started, which is with circularly polarized modes. So not very gratifying, but at least they were able to show um, uh, experimentally 12-state um, OAM propagation in a fiber, um, which is progress, but um, hopefully there will be more later. Um, there's, uh, since I'm up against the time, I'm not going to go through, uh, there's other experiments um, of uh, showing the same thing, um, various ways of, of looking at it. Um, but I'm going to wrap up here. Um, so we said that, saw that spin orbit coupling is an intrinsic feature of light and um, in homogeneous media or non-paraxial beams. Um, it explains the, the structure of modes in optical fiber, both low and high contrast. Um, we saw it explains this unconventional polarization structure of uh, high contrast fiber modes. Um, and the, the Keller-Rubinoff method is what um, enabled all of it. So I'll stop there. Uh, questions? So uh, a basic OAM mode would be, orbital angular momentum mode would be made out of two, a superposition of two spatial modes that are orthogonal to one another, I guess. Two second order modes, one with a node in the x direction and the other with a node in the y direction. Uh, okay. Um, so I want, I'm wondering if um, there's any advantage for using OAM modes, those two which are sort of the two different possible superpositions of the those static modes versus using the OAM modes for telecommunications and fibers, for example, whether that's known or not. Um, so the both in fibers and in free space, the question of whether OAM modes are the right modes or the best modes, um, my understanding is that it's, it's really a question of, um, of convenience of the available technology. Um, it, so in, in free space, for instance, um, Jeff Shapiro's group at, at MIT did some very nice work on looking at um, the effects of turbulence, and they showed that the Hermit Gaussian and Laguerre um, Gaussian modes behave absolutely identically as far as um, as far as uh, robustness to turbulence. If you can do perfect um, um, adaptive optics, but with um, the possible advantage in that case of of using OAM is uh, when you're doing um, non-perfect, imperfect um, adaptive optics um, using current technology, um, it turns out there may be advantages to using OAM. Um, and uh, another thing about OAM is um, Miles Paget developed this very nice OAM sorter, which um, is actually shown. Uh, way back at the beginning right here. Um, I actually, it's, it's such a nice device, I should have had a slide on it. But this, is, this goes back to the original, um, how do you um, observe the orbital angular momentum of a single, single photon? They developed some, a really nice device um, that can sort on angular momentum without doing projective measurements. And so that's you know, possibly one reason to use OAM. But um, it, it I don't know of any fundamental reason. It's really convenience based on technology. Any other questions? So there is a recent work in the metamaterial community on metamaterial screens and one that uses this optical sp uh, this splitting of um, according to circular polarizations. But 
the application of the theory is a bit shaky because it's not uh, a slowly varying refractive index media. Has anything you learned uh, show a way to uh, more systematically apply, apply the theory? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, and that's probably the long answer as well. But it's a good question. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, a question maybe related to that one. Um, I thought that, you know, high contrast, or when, when by manufacturing you have defects during the manufacturing process, the coupling be between these modes and evanescent modes are very strong. So basically, it's a way to, you know, uh, kind of lose all the energy in the core. Um, well, you said you didn't did do experiments, but did you see that in the numerical simulation, maybe, that uh, if you introduce defects along these fibers, you can lose all the modes? Um, so, OK, so there, there, first, as far as experiments goes, there were experiments on the air core high contrast fiber, and they were done at kilometer length scales. They were not completely satisfactory because um, the fields uh, were only grazing incidents on the air core. So it is an open question right now as to whether uh, manufacturing induced um, imperfections along the air core boundary um, will cause the kinds of problems you're talking about. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the fiber, uh, Paul Christensen, the fiber um, uh, manufacturer um, here was, uh, he didn't anticipate that that would be a particular problem here, but it has not been experimentally answered. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Stephen again.